I want to thank you for inviting me to this conference. I regret that I have not been able to join you in Budapest in person. I have been asked to send some videotaped comments, and this I do with pleasure. My time is brief, so I can only offer some telegraphic propositions. The first half are of a general nature. The rest are about the politics of extreme right in India that straddles the world of liberal institutional form on the one hand and majoritarian claims of religious identity on the other. I should be concerned mostly with religious forms of legitimation, so let me offer a comment on a classically influential formulation of liberalism itself. I refer here to the idea that freedom of the market in the production and distribution of wealth is intrinsically correlated to liberal freedoms in the political domain. I know that between John Locke and the present, present, all kinds of cautions and subtleties have been introduced into the liberalist doctrine. However, contemporary neoliberalism is itself a stark restatement of that earlier doctrine. Liberalism in this form seems to me simply untenable. The Keynesian, <coughs> sorry, the Hayekian worldview has to be corrected with at least a version of Keynesian economics that tries to save liberalism from that extremity. Markets, in my view, are good servants and good informers, but mad, bad masters. Once the deregulated markets have been accepted as the ultimate arbiters of the social good, they will only produce more and more inequality and social decomposition. We have reached a point of market freedom so absolute that about 50 persons now own about half of the planet's wealth. Such steep decline in the politics of equality is bound to produce savageries in the politics of identity. Neoliberal economics does not create those savageries, but contributes greatly to their malignant growth. Within the Western world alone, this ranges from the Greek golden dawn to the evangelical churches and the whites only militias in the United States, and from growing respectability of Islamophobia across nations and classes to the rise of new fascist groupings and parties of the far right all over Europe, which who, with new claims of national purity and ethnic self-enclosure. In the case of Islamophobia, centuries of Western Christianity's parochial disdain for the Muslim is quite evident in the United States, which is a deeply religious, even largely a fundamentalist country anyway. However, I suspect that there is a covert, often unacknowledged religious strain in the European Islamophobic who speaks only in the language of cultural difference and claims that Muslims just don't know how to adapt to the liberal European culture. The response of the state systems has been to defend a deepen liberalization in the economy and to erect illiberal structures in systems of governance. One after another, the leading Western states the United States, Britain, France in particular, are creating elaborate national security apparatuses that correspond not only to what Foucault theorized as regimes of permanent surveillance, but also to what Carl Schmitt theorized as the juridic notion of the exception, which in his view was not a matter of a state of emergency, but a permanent prerogative of the sovereign. This is done in the name of the war on terror, but one cannot help noticing that the process has been speeded up since the economic crisis of 2008. In a rather considerable part of the non-Western world, not too far from Europe, the effects of very intense kinds of economic dislocation 
and extreme political repression are further aggravated by the most murderous kinds of perpetual warfare that have been visited upon entire populations since the Twin Towers attacks at the dawn of the century, resulting in many kinds of mass hysteria, including great growth in the millenarian hysterical forms of politicized religiosity. In such circumstances, religion can certainly serve as the side of the oppressed and the heart of a heartless world, but just as often, it can also lead to outbreak of mass irrationality and violence, sectarian militias, and ethnic bloodbaths. <clears throat> when I try to think of a modern analog for the current franchises of Al-Qaeda, and the soldiery of Mr. Baghdadi's caliphate. What comes to mind most vividly is the Pol Pot regime and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, a country as savagely broken in its time as Iraq or Libya or Syria today. What is at stake here is neither religion nor communism, even though the Khmer Rouge invoked communism just as the jihadis invoke Islam in defense of their massacres. What is, stake at rather, <clears throat> what is at stake rather is a rational comprehension of the outbreak of irrationality and savagery on such a mass scale and the role that the liberal states themselves have played in creating these conditions. <clears throat> to be fair, of course, the liberal Western democracies and their armies have done only a part of the damage. Another part has been done by the dictatorial and monarchical regimes in the region, and now by NATO's own Islamicists in Turkey. These alliances of the liberal and the illiberal have led to a blockage of a kind that would be very difficult to reverse. <coughs> Let me turn directly to the question of religion and say right away that I don't believe there is necessary correlation between religion as such and illiberal governance, whatever that phrase might mean. Liberation theology has been a powerful force against autocracies in Latin America, but also in favor of social and doctrinal liberalization within the Catholic Church. But the Christianity of liberation theology is not the same as the Christianity of American evangelical churches, the Christianities of the Serb militias, or that of the Protestant denominations, and in particular, Pentecostalism that have challenged liberation theology so massively all over South America. I offer this very obvious example in support of the equally obvious proposition that all questions pertaining to the political role of religion are specific, historical, and contextual. I will go further and assert that all state systems in the modern world are essentially secular in nature in the sense that modern statecraft is a profane vocation. Modern monarchies and theocracies such as Saudi Arabia or Iran are no exception. <clears throat> the important thing about Saudi Arabia, for instance, is that it is a monarchy controlling immense amounts of petroleum under the sands and petrodollars in the banks, which then make it possible for it to acquire the most advanced weaponry from the West, and which is why the security of the kingdom has been a sacrosanct element in U.S. foreign policy since President Roosevelt. This material power underwrites the Wahhabi brand of Islam, of Islam that legitimates the monarchy and gives to Saudi society, including its education system and popular mentalities, a particular shape. The Saudi royals then try to export to the rest of the Sunni world with very considerable success, thanks largely to their financial power, and they are the most successful either in societies that are most like themselves, namely the Gulf Sheikhdoms, or in states or communities already beset by serious crises, such as Pakistan after the Bangladesh war, 
Lebanon after the civil war or among Iraqi Sunnis after the break, outbreak of sectarianism in wake of the US invasion of that country. The Saudi monarchy did not always have this kind of power. The monarchy was beleaguered and unstable throughout the period when Arab secular nationalism was dominant in the region and the Wahhabi tendency was little more than a local belief system. It was only after Nasserism was decisively defeated by the Israelis in 1967 that Saudi Arabia began rising so to such prominence in regional and even world affairs. I would argue that religion per se has no independent role in modern politics. It comes to have a role, minor or major, liberal or illiberal, in particular historical circumstances, and only when it gets attached to certain forces and processes. With this remark then, let me turn to some aspects of Indian politics. Any contact with modern political forms in India date, dates back really to the colonial period and the hallmark of a colony is that a colonial subject cannot at the same time be a citizen. So there was really no way to organize political representation on the democratic rights of citizenship. It is in this context that Muslims and Hindus came to be constituted not only as co-religionists respectively but also as political communities. For a long time representation was allotted to selected groups of elites in accordance with religious identity and ethnic community. The question of religion and secularity arose with reference to emergent Indian nationhood in this context. I don't have the time to go into the complexities of that history, so I'll summarize it in terms of a rather paradoxical contrast between the two most famous exponents of contrary views. <coughs> On one side, we have Mahatma Gandhi, a highly pietistic Hindu given to translating political imperatives into religious vocabulary and who often said that a politics that strays too far from religious values is sinful. However, he also detested religious extremism, supported ecumenical respect for all religions in social life, and secular liberalism in state practice. Eventually, he chose the agnostic and devoutly liberal Mr. Nehru as his successor. What followed from all this was a vision of the emergent Indian nation as a secular and pluralist polity, multilingual, multi-religious, multi-ethnic polity. This view was broadly shared among liberal nationalists and all stripes of the left. By contrast, V. D. Savarkar, the legendary ideologue of Hindu political extremism, was a self-confessed atheist who believed that Indians who subscribe to Christianity and Islam, religions born outside India, could never be treated as equal to Hindus. He also thought that Hitler's solution for the Jews had much to teach Hindus about how to deal with Indian Muslims. The pietistic Gandhi has been the icon of secular liberal India. The atheist Savarkar is the ideological hero of the Hindutva forces of the extreme right who are in power today. <coughs> How did Savarkar square the circle between his atheism and his Hindu nationalism? Well, by re-baptizing the Hindu system of religious belief as the original primordial trans-historical culture, a shared religion of blood and soil among all true Indians with no obligation to believe, believe in a particular form of divinity. He often used the term Hindu race. He regarded Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, etc. as branches of Hinduism itself 
and reserved his hatred for Islam and Christianity as alien elements in Indian society to be either purged or subordinated into second class citizenship. He invented the term Hindutva for this whole ideological framework and the term Hindu Rashtra to designate the identity between the Hindu nation and the projected Hindu state. Thus, Savarkar was the first major political figure in India to collapse religion, culture, race, ethnicity, nation, and a state project into a single unity with a sharp line of demarcation between us and them, friend and enemy. <coughs> the Rashtriya Swamik Sevak Sangh, the, the RSS, the main organization that devoted itself to realizing Savarkar's prescriptions, was founded in 1925 in the heyday of European fascisms and far-right populisms, borrowing much from those projects. Inside the country, it often colluded with British colonial authorities against the left and secular nationalist forces. It was briefly banned after independence on charges of having been having incited Mahatma Gandhi's assassination and Savarkar himself was put on trial. After the ban was lifted, RSS gave undertakings to work inside the framework of the Indian constitution and kept proposing to Prime Minister Nehru a common front against communists. Unlike Islamic scripturalists and fundamentalists, however, it proposed no theocracy for India. The strategy it adopted was a complex one. The RSS gave to itself a formal legal status of a cultural organization that does not participate in politics. Instead, it opened many fronts, in the fullness of time, hundreds of fronts, for organizing in favor of its long-term project all possible social units of India's highly heterogeneous society, including the primary political front, the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, which currently rules the country. This is something important to understand. The present ruling party of India is in fact not a political party in any normal sense. It is only a political front of another superior organization, namely the RSS, that provides all the major leaders and key cadre of the front, which then registers itself as a political party and has risen to rule the country. <coughs> Sorry. At the time of state or federal elections, tens of thousands of RSS members work as volunteers in BJP's electoral campaigns. The current Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, worked most of his adult life as a full-time pracharak, teacher and proselytizer in local and regional RSS branches throughout the country until RSS arranged for him to emerge as the Chief Minister of Gujarat, a state in Western India, and then as Prime Minister of the country at the head of the BJP governments. In effect then, what we have is a government of the RSS, a publicly unaccountable, extra-parliamentary, supra-political organization of the far right in the guise of a legitimate political party, the BJP, which claims allegiance to normal parliamentary practices of the liberal order, even as its rule is fully buttressed by all sorts of goon squads, paramilitary fronts of the RSS, and constant low-intensity violence against the religious minorities, which have been taught daily lessons to accept Hindu majoritarian supremacy. This political project is organically connected to organization of a veritable cultural revolution from below. The RSS established hundreds of thousands of branches and tens of thousands of secondary schools and localities, large and small, throughout India to propagate the social, religious, political views of the RSS among not only adults, but also children from an early age to create a revised 
novel version of what Antonio Gramsci used to call common sense. The project is now about 100 years old. By now, the RSS has a very major presence in wall box of Indian life, educational institutions, TV and print media, the army and other security agencies, civil bureaucracy, all levels of the judiciary, etc. Not to speak of a spectacularly organized social media. It has always been extremely well funded by mercantile capital. In the recent national elections, all major CEOs and literally thousands of Indian origin entrepreneurs and businessmen living abroad endorsed Mr. Modi's candidacy as prime minister. Unlike the European fascisms and authoritarianisms of the 1930s, and unlike most Islamic extremists, RSS has never had any significant discourse that rejects the liberal democratic institutions of parliamentary democracy. It seems to believe that such institutions are perfectly feasible for realization of the social and political ideals of the far right. The scale in India is spectacular. For the rest, the same question is getting posed in large parts of Europe and the US as well. Is there really an irreconcilable contradiction between politics of the far right and the institutional structures of liberalism? I don't believe this question can be pushed under the rug any longer or answered too easily. Thank you very much.